Okay, so we've got three games to talk about, starting with the highly anticipated Game 47 against the Chicago Blackhawks. The excitement surrounding this game had been generating ever since the release of the Canucks schedule before the season even started. Why? Well, because it marks the debut of superstar rookie phenom Connor Bedard playing against his hometown team in the city he was born and raised in. Unfortunately, just over two weeks ago, Bedard suffered an injury after getting hit by Devils defender Brendan Smith. Now, there was a lot of people debating online whether this hit was dirty or not, but I don't think it was. Either way, Bedard was set to miss six to eight weeks with a broken jaw. Devastating news for Canucks fans who were excited to see their future franchise player up close and personal. But then, to everyone's surprise, just over a week after being injured, Bedard was back on the ice skating with his team and the hopes that he'd end up playing in this game against Vancouver were going right back up. But then, mysteriously, the team announced he'd be out for at least another six weeks. So, no Bedard. And speaking of injuries, Carson Soucy is hurt again. This time it's his hand and he's out for at least five weeks. While it sucks to lose Soucy, there's a big opportunity here for Noah Juleson to cement a spot as an NHL regular. Also, let's quickly flash back to Game 45 against the Coyotes, where Kuzmenko made an amazing pass to the wrong team and was benched for the entire third period. Then to Game 46 against the Maple Leafs where he played a lot better and was even cracking jokes on the bench again. Even if it was only two games, Kuzi was clearly trending in the right direction and that continued in Game 47 against the Chicago Blackhawks. Look at this Patrick Kane looking ass pass he made to Pew Suter to open the scoring. This man's great great grandfather must have been a Beyblade or something because at least that would explain the tightness and speed of the spins he pulls off on a game to game basis. Bases. One nothing Canucks. And guess what? Kuzi was right back out there spinning around like seven year old me after losing my mom in the grocery store, but for this play, he wasn't the highlight. That belongs to Captain Quinn Hughes. Look, I'm ready to make a statement that may be a little premature, it might be a tad controversial, but here it is. Quinn Hughes is not only the best player on the Canucks, I think he's the best player the Canucks have ever had. I also think, based on the way he's playing right now, he's a top five player in the NHL. I'm standing by those words, but if you disagree, feel free to kindly explain why I'm wrong in the comments below. But before you get to typing, look at this shot. 2-0 Canucks. Now back to Kuzmenko for a second, it was already pretty clear that his confidence was coming back, but if you weren't convinced yet, I'm sure this through the legs move he attempted late in the first period will do it for you. Now, despite a couple clutch saves from Thatcher Demko and whatever this was from Peter Mrazek, not much else really happened in this game. The Canucks won 2-0 and Demko got his league leading fifth shutout of the season. Here's what coach Rick Tockett said about the game. I love shutouts. Now, back in December, a strange video depicting some sort of new helmet was posted on the Canucks social media platforms. The caption read coming January 2024. Well, 23 days into January, we finally found out what they were alluding to in that post. Following the lead of the Vegas Golden Knights and the Los Angeles Kings, the Canucks added metallic helmets to their wardrobe. Now, the initial fan reactions were mixed, to say the least, but that doesn't matter because the whole operation is for a good cause. The helmets are only going to be worn for two games this season before being sold at an auction for charity. And Game 48 against the St. Louis Blues was set to be the first time we'd see the boys rocking the blue chrome domes. I thought they looked fine, but I don't really care. They could come out wearing mini skirts and flip flops, and as long as they kept winning, I'd be happy. Now, it's worth noting that the Canucks have gone undefeated in regulation since losing to the Blues a couple of weeks ago, so this game was going to be a little bit of payback, hopefully. Noah Juleson made his presence known right off the bat when he laid a big hit on Nathan Walker, who was the first and only Australian player in the NHL, by the way. Then look at our boy Nils the Thrills Big Hog Boss Hog Hoglander continuing to put his all into every shift. He's getting better every game, and it's not just in the offensive zone. Watch how he protects the puck here and breaks out of the defensive zone, and when his line mates dump the puck in for a change, he opts to stay on the ice and forecheck. He didn't get possession, but the havoc he caused led to the Blues icing the puck. Now, I want you to take note of the time on the scoreboard here, because what you're watching right now is two full minutes of offensive zone pressure, puck possession, and overall dominance from the Canucks. They were doing everything right for these two minutes, and even when Kuzmenko gave the puck away, leading to an odd man rush for the Blues, Casey DeSmith was like, oh cool, it's finally my turn, and made a beautiful save. It really felt like the Canucks were going to run away with this game, but then this happened. Thomas still out there, centers, neighbor scores! Man, hockey can be funny sometimes. Whatever, they'll get it back. Now, with the level of confidence Kuzmenko was playing with last game, you can understand why I got excited when he got possession of the puck in the offensive zone. But let's pause it for a second so I can show you a clip from one of Coach Tockett's post-game interviews from back in December. I want him to do spin I, I love that. You just gotta be calculated, you know? If you have no speed, you're at the blue line. Probably not the right time to do a spin -arama. Well, Kuzmenko regained his confidence, but with that came 
his old habits, because after making some spins on the blue line, he lost the puck and it led to a great scoring chance for the Blues. However, I do have to give Kuzi some credit too, because he back-checked hard, blocked one of the shots, and even cleared the puck off the line to save a goal. But none of that would have happened if he just remembered the details Talkit is trying to get him to focus on. Then Juleson got called for delay of game, and the Blues scored to make it 2 nothing. It's one of those games, I guess. Now, when the first period ended, all the players from both teams went to the dressing room like normal, except for Kuzmenko. He stayed behind for an extra minute or so and just sat there, alone, in front of 19,000 strangers. You know, at this point, Kuzi could have a whole TV show based on the things he gets up to on the bench. From cracking jokes to cracking open a Pepsi to go with his banana, he's been putting on quite the show, and this is just the newest episode. Anyway, Pew Suter cut the Blues' lead in half, scoring his 10th goal of the season less than a minute into the third period, to make it 2-1 for the Blues. Maybe it wasn't going to be one of those games. Over the corner. Centers a score! 41 seconds after Shooter scored for Vancouver. <sighs> I guess it is one of those games. 3-1 for the Blues. And if you don't believe me, just a few minutes later, the Canucks' leading scorer, Brock Besser, missed a fairly wide-open net. But then the Blues were called for cross-checking, giving the Canucks their second power play of the game, and Suter scored again to bring his team within one. 3-2 for the Blues. And then with only one minute remaining in the game, the Canucks pulled their goalie, called a timeout, and then this happened. Miller able to draw it back Last to the Philip Corona. Here's Pedersen protecting the puck. Corona takes his pass. Feeds Hughes. He shoots. Oh, post. Shooter. Scores. <laughs> It's one of those games. Suter completes the hat trick, sending the game to overtime, tied 3 3. Shen takes a pass, he shoots, he scores. Okay, so it is one of those games. Now, that last goal for the Blues was extremely controversial because right before Braden Shen scored, he interfered with Pedersen in front of the net. Here's my take on it. Yes, this was interference. There's no doubt about that. But Petey added some sauce to that fall, and there's no doubt about that either. He tried to sell it and honestly didn't do a very good job. If he had just got up, stayed with the play, and stuck to his man, there might have been a different ending to this game. Yes, Petey was interfered with, but he oversold it and caused his team the game. That's just the truth. That's for faking. We can be mad that there was no call, we can be mad that Petey tried to sell a call at a very inopportune time, or we can just blame the shiny blue helmets and move on. I choose the latter. Now, on to game 49 against the Columbus Blue Jackets, the final game before the league-wide All-Star break. And to no one's surprise, the Canucks looked great in the first period. Ian Cole made a stellar defensive play here. Tyler Myers made a wonderful defensive play here. Quinn Hughes was moonwalking through his opponents and setting up scoring chances. Nikita Zadorov made a great defensive read, stepping up to hit Jack Roslovic, muffling any shred of potential offense for the Blue Jackets. Then, just a minute later, during a two-on-one against the Canucks, Zadorov came in clutch again, back-checking hard to disrupt the play. The Canucks were getting their chances, but I guess Elvis Merzlikens was still pulling that monster out of him because he was stopping everything. Moving on to the second period now, still tied 0-0, Noah Juleson was noticeable again. Look at this pristine pass he made to send JT Miller and Brock Besser in on a two-on-one. Then, the Canucks got a power play, but Petey gave the puck away and Columbus scored shorthanded to make it 1-0. Come on, guys! We can't blame the shiny blue helmets this time, please! A few moments later. From behind the net. Centers, Crowley scores. I can't lie to you guys. I threw up all over my legs when I saw that puck hit the back of the net there. It's not that we're losing to Columbus. There's no such thing as an easy game in the NHL. It's the fact that I ate 14 burritos before the game started, and I watched the game standing in front of my TV like this. It's a bad combination. Don't do it unless you want to ruin your pants. Anyway, Demko made a couple sexy saves, and that brought me back to life. Then watch this. Remember that two-on-one Miller and Besser had earlier? Well, they got another chance in almost identical fashion but this time Miller chose to pass it to Besser rather than shoot it himself, and it worked. 2-1 for the Blue Jackets. Man, Miller is an amazing player, which is why it was so strange to see him give the puck to the other team so they could score another one just two minutes later. I'm gonna trust that he knew what he was doing here. He must have something up his sleeve. A few moments later. Put one in front, that was tipped off the post, and it came off the back of Demko and into the goal. <laughs> okay. <sighs> Okay, well, the Canucks are down 4-1 at the top of the third period. They're not going to win every single game. It really isn't the end of the- He shoots! He scores! Okay, well, they got another one. It's 4-2 now, but my point still stands. We can't expect them to win every single game. We got to remember that at the start of the season, the best most of us could ask for was just a playoff berth, and now they're first in the league. So let's not put unnecessary pressure on them to win every single- Let's go the shot! Deflected in! Yeah, it was nice to see Besser get another one here to make the score a little less harsh on the eyes, but as I was saying, we really shouldn't be expecting this team to win all the time. I don't care where they sit in the standings, Columbus is a hard-working team, and they'll put up a fight every game, and for this one, they got the better of the Canucks, and that's okay. Besser scores a hat-trick! 
<laughs> Brock Besser gets the hat trick, tying the game 4 4 with his 30th goal of the season. This team is going to win every single game left. <laughs> Look, I'm not going to talk about how Tyler Myers got called for a penalty that wasn't even initially called, which was a huge mistake on the part of the referees and possibly even against the rules, leading to a five-minute power play for the Blue Jackets that the Canucks expertly killed off. I'm not going to talk about that because who cares? Instead, I'm going to take you back to March 28, 2019, Quinn Hughes' first game in the NHL. The first time we'd ever see the big three draft picks, Brock Besser, Elias Pettersson, and Quinn Hughes playing on the same ice. It was a game against the LA Kings that ended up going to overtime, and while the Young Guns didn't close the game out with a goal, they did put on quite the show, leading to this historic call from John Shorthouse. Enjoy the future, folks. Here it is right now. Pedersen, Besser, and Hughes. Now, guess what three players came together to close out game 49 in overtime? Takes the pass, steps around Johnson, Brock Besser across, Pedersen, scores! The future is here. This is beautiful. The Canucks are still first in the league, but let's order it by point percentage to account for the different amount of games played for each team. Oh, still first. Okay, well, maybe the Canucks are winning a lot in overtime, so let's just order it by regulation wins. Oh, weird. Huh. Well, maybe they're winning a lot of one-goal games, so let's order it by goal differential. Surely this will show that the Canucks aren't actually the best team in the league. Oh, okay. Maybe... maybe the Canucks are the best team in the league? Huh. Anyway, I have an update on the score prediction leaderboard. I've decided that you are allowed to predict losses for the Canucks. However, correct predictions for losses will only count as one point in the standings. Whereas if you predict a win correctly, you'll be awarded with two points. With that system in place, here are the current top three. In third place, we've got Matthew B1601 with three points. In second place, we've got a five-way tie between O Energy HD, Dr. T3346, O Bubble, Chef CO3, and Daniel Feltzman7241, all tied with four points. And finally, in first place with six points, we've got a two-way tie between Nuclear Grudon and Scylla5024. If you want to see where you sit in the standings, I've posted the full leaderboard on my Instagram. Anyway, this video was brought to you by the kind people who signed up to become a member of the channel. Giant thank you to each and every one of you. If you too want to support the channel and get some cool perks out of it, click the link in the description or hit the join button under this video. See you guys later. Whenever we have a guest on After Hours, we ask fans to send in question, uh, questions <laughs> via Twitter. If we had 70 for you, tonight. I'd say 65 of them were about Vancouver. Uh, can you wait to get back to Vancouver? Do you still have your house in Vancouver? How badly do you want to play again with Quinn Hughes? They wouldn't stop.